Real people, real breakthroughs. This is the Psychology of Eating podcast, where psychology and nutrition meet to uncover the true causes of our unwanted eating concerns. Your relationship with food will never be the same. Now, here's your host, eating psychology expert and founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, Mark David. Greetings, everybody. I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, and here we are in the Psychology of Eating podcast, and I'm with Iris today. Welcome, Iris. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Good to see you again, and let me just say a few words to viewers and listeners. If you are new to the podcast, um, Iris and I are having a follow-up session. We met a bunch of months ago, and this is our chance to just get caught up and see you know, what happened for her since then. And we're going to take about 20 or 30 minutes. So Iris, if you can just share with people kind of what the core pieces are that you had wanted to work on and kind of give us a weather report, how you've been doing since our session. Sure. Well, I wanted to get rid of my obsession with my weight. So Mm -hmm. I was constantly weighing myself and wanting to lose weight as well. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to achieve both. But the major thing I wanted to do was to get rid of the obsession with uh, weighing myself constantly, (coughs) excuse me, and, you know, worrying about how I looked and what I weighed and all that kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. I think... um, What I did was, you recommended that I put away the scales, which I did. I put them downstairs in my borders (coughs) borders bathroom so I don't have any access to them. Mm -hmm. And I went through a bit of withdrawal symptoms to begin with, you know, wanting to weigh myself constantly. But really, I don't miss it at all. And it's quite liberating not um, worrying about what the number on the scale is. And I've also lost some weight. And I know that because my clothes fit better, they're a bit looser. I have one particular uh, little black dress that I wasn't able to zip up properly before. And I can almost get that done up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not quite. but So I have actually lost some weight. But I'm not so much concerned with that anymore because um, I think... The thing that you said to me during our last session that really hit home for me was you said to me, it's like you have the winning lottery ticket in your pocket and you're not looking at it or you're not taking it out. I can't remember what the second part of what you said was, but that was what really stayed with me. And then you asked me to do a gratitude journal as well, which I did every day for several months and I still do it, but not every day. And I think that has made a huge difference because... Because I've been focusing on what I'm grateful for, uh, I'm less looking at the negative and I have so much to be grateful for. I have this beautiful house that I inherited from my mum. I have two wonderful boarders who live here. I have really good health. I'm not on any medications. Mm -hmm. I'll be 60 next year. Uh, I have great friends. I live in a beautiful place. I have a lot to be grateful for. So I think shifting my focus to gratitude has probably made the biggest change for me, I'd say. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me ask you, remind me, how, how many times a day would you say you would previously weigh yourself? Oh, just once. Mm-hmm. I'd weigh myself once. Like years ago, I would weigh myself maybe three, four times mm-hmm. a day. That was when I was still dieting, but I haven't dieted for years. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was more once a day. And, yeah. and so now how long has it been since you weighed yourself? Uh, since we had our last call, which I think was six months ago. Yeah. 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 And I was, I was even contemplating weighing myself before this call because mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew I'd lost some weight. And I thought, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't mm. want to do that. I don't want to go back there. I may weigh myself at some stage, but um, that, that wasn't necessary. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's – I'm really happy for you. And, 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 and I'm especially happy for you because, to me, your intention was – I have this obsession and I want to sort of pop this balloon. I want to let this obsession go, you know, and and normally I I think what happens is people think, well, if I have this obsession and let's say in this case to lose the weight, then the only way I'm going to get rid of the obsession is to lose the weight. Yeah. (laughs) And 
The weird thing is the obsession piece oftentimes gets in the very way of the goal that we want to begin with, <laughs> whatever it is. So to me, anytime I'm, I'm working with someone or listening to someone who is kind of out of balance or they're stressed or they're obsessing, and I'm kind of using all those terms interchangeably, about their weight and they're not kind of standing on their own feet and just sort of grounded in their own reality, I know that they're not going to have a good chance of actually getting where they want to go. Um, you know, in order for yeah. us to... In order for us to create change, we have to be, I think, um, we have to be on our A-game. And, and part of being on our A-game means I'm not beating myself up along the way to reach my goal. I mean, it would be pretty silly if, you know, you said, I want to be a great person. I want to be a great parent, a great friend. And in order to do that, you just beat yourself up every day, you know. <laughs> If you're not yeah. sure, I, I, I mean, it, it's it's so bizarre to think that that's what we do, especially in the weight loss universe. And yeah. it's a big shift for people to think, wait a second, let's turn this around. And before we focus on the weight loss, let's focus on the obsession loss and then <clears throat> see what happens. <clears throat> so interesting to me that, that you clearly lost some weight. What do you attribute the weight loss too? Did you change your diet? Did you exercise more? Like, what do you think? I definitely didn't exercise more. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think I started listening to my body more and I was more relaxed. So I was really wanting to have juices. So I went on a, um, a juice thing for a week, not in order to lose weight, but because I wanted to have more energy. Mm -hmm. And now I have a smoothie for breakfast every morning. So I have, um, you know, raw fruits and vegetables and coconut water. And that's really satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening more to my body. So uh, whereas, I mean, I still do this, but I do it a lot less. I would be stressed about something and I'd go to the cupboard to find something to eat. So I'd normally turn to food if I had, um, you know, if I was missing my mum or if I was feeling a bit lonely or if something was stressing me out or even at certain times of the day, I'd go to the cupboard to look for food. And I don't so much do that anymore because I do quite a lot of art journaling now and I find that that's a great way to process my feelings mm -hmm. so I'm not so much turning to food anymore for comfort so I did change my diet and I try to you know not eat too much after 7 p.m in the evening and I try to make sure I have my lunch in the middle of the day and I have a really good breakfast that has a lot of live food so pro probably I'm eating more live foods you know more fruits and vegetables and um, you know not cooking as much food. Mm. Yeah. You know, the, the <clears throat> listening to my body more, you know, what, what, what fascinates me about that term is it's hard to kind of define what that means, you know, with a typical dictionary definition. Here's what listening to one's body means. But I think it's very easy to notice, particularly in retrospect, the times in our lives when we really haven't listened to our bodies. And, you know, one of the ways we don't listen to the body is when we get trapped in the head. Mm. You know, yeah. when, when everything is going on up here, oh my God, I gotta lose this weight, oh my God, I gotta weigh myself, oh my God, I'm not good enough. I'm not. So we get trapped in our head and there's less kind of communication that goes on and it's almost like we become a life support system for our brain. Um, <laughs> and we just kind of drag the body along. And it's this fascinating X factor that happens because what you just described to me when you said, I'm listening to my body more. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm doing a smoothie at breakfast. I'm eating more raw foods. It doesn't sound to me like you're pushing yourself or forcing yourself. There's more of a naturalness to it. And I think when we listen to our body, there's something very natural about that. It's not a fight because a lot of people yeah. are fighting their body, you know, particularly when it comes to our weight. I think you can do that with, a, um, say, a healthy eating regime as well. Like if, say, if you chose to go on the paleo diet or, or whatever kind of eating system, I think you can really beat yourself up about that too. Like if you, if you happen to go off it and eat something that's not approved, you know, like you can get caught in your head 
following a healthy diet as well. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't doesn't necessarily matter what you're eating, but um, but you can get stuck and beat yourself up and think you've done the wrong thing or whatever. Like I've noticed it more in my friends now. I have a friend who comes over painting once a week with me and she's or oh, she'd be close to 70 and she's always asking, do I look fat in this? You know, oh, this is fattening and she won't allow herself to have pleasure with food because she's thinking that it's going to um, – make a fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But, but I just kind of noticed that more, whereas maybe before I would have taken that as a given that, of course, oh, that's what we all do because we're all striving, especially as women, like to look a particular way and, you know, conform to some ideal shape that we're supposed to be. So I think maybe women do it much more than men. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think that may be true. That's certainly what I've noticed. And it doesn't mean that there aren't men who do that very intensely. I just yeah. think numbers-wise, percentage-wise, women have more been owning that self-rejection domain, and it's not because there's anything wrong with women. It's just that the advertisers of the world are very brilliant. They are very practiced and very rehearsed and very well-studied, and they know how to aim marketing at the masculine mind and at the feminine mind. And they understand that the feminine mind is highly, highly sensitive to criticism of the physical form, like super yeah. sensitive. And yeah. based on that, it's easy to do things to get y'all to buy whatever, whatever they want <laughs> you to buy. Um, yeah. and, but in order to buy stuff, we have to be unhappy. And in order to be unhappy, we have to be getting negative messages, and then we have to take those negative messages and internalize them. So we're getting it through the movies and through the videos and through social media, wherever we get it from, but then we internalize it and we take over. So we're constantly advertising to ourselves, I'm no good, I'm not good enough, which yeah. tends to make us better consumers of things. Yeah. So I don't have a TV anymore. <laughs> So I, I don't have ads, yeah. Have your friends, do you think, have, have your friends noticed any changes in you as a person since you've had this shift? Uh, my friend, well, my friend who always says that she's fat <laughs> and she's not, she has noticed that I've lost weight, but I, I didn't know her very well before the, the last call. I've, she's only become a friend lately. Mm-hmm. And uh, where I live here, because I've been away for four years, I haven't been here, I don't have a great deal of friends um, that, that I see here. So uh, I don't know, but people do. I did join Toastmasters a couple of months ago because mm-hmm. I want to get good at public speaking. And people there say to me, like I'm nervous when I go to do a speech, but I'm okay when I start speaking. And people there do say to me, what are you on? Like, do you smoke marijuana or something? Like, you're so (laughs) relaxed. Like, how come you're just a natural? Like, it just comes out of you. So maybe I think um, if I compare that to how I may have been before, I would say the biggest thing is I'm more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I'm more relaxed, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would love to remind us, especially people tuning in, um, I just want to highlight what you just said and note that it's a very um, physiologic and scientific phenomenon. When we relax more, we are technically in the relaxation response. We're in parasympathetic nervous system dominance. That is the place where humans do their healthiest digestion. That is the place where we have our most natural appetite regulation. That's the place where we have higher thinking most active. If you want to be in reactive, nervous energy thinking, you want to be in a stress response. If you want to think higher thoughts, you want to be in a relaxation response. Also, the odd thing is we calorie burn on a day-in, day-out level best in the relaxation response. So yes, when you're exercising for an hour a day, maybe, yeah, you burn a lot of calories, but the majority of calories that a human being burns is burned in the 23 hours of the day that you're not exercising. So (laughs) when we are more relaxed as humans, we change our physiology, literally. So anything that helps us relax, and relaxation means I'm not attacking myself. Relaxation means I'm not hating on myself. I'm not speaking negative mantras to myself. Relaxation means, yes, I am looking at life and seeing it through a little bit more of a positive lens and 
letting go of so much of the nonsense that we're taught to say to ourselves, sometimes it's that simple. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying that that's the only way to lose weight, but I'm yeah. saying it's a prerequisite to real, sustainable, lasting weight loss that we could enjoy. I mean, I don't know if you've yeah. ever... I don't know if you've ever met anyone who, you know, has the weight loss or the body that they want, but they're so uptight and so stressed and so miserable because they're constantly dieting, they're constantly exercising, they're constantly watching what they eat. And yes. yeah, you might have the body that you want, but you're living in misery. Um, yeah. Doesn't interest yeah. me per se. No, <laughs> no, me either. No. I, I just remember years ago when I used, I used to work at a newspaper in Sydney for 10 years and it was a very stressful job and every year I went on holidays and I went to India four times and uh, every time I went on holidays I'd go for like anywhere between six and, and eight weeks. I'd eat heaps of food and I'd always lose heaps of weight because mm -hmm. I was relaxed, like I was happy, I was enjoying where I was, I wasn't stressed and when I went back to the job, which I didn't enjoy, I always looked to food, you know. Food was my attempt to escape the job, which yeah. was crazy when you think about it. I'd go to morning tea and have something, you know, have a cake or something, and I'd think I would escape through the food somehow, but then, you know, 10 minutes later I'd have to go back to my desk. I was yeah. still there. But it was a psychologically somehow I thought I could escape by, through the food. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish I knew truly how many times I've heard that story, some version of it, and, and hundreds of times over the years, yeah. especially, you know, I've probably seen thousands of hands get raised because, you know, for so many years I was teaching live three, four times a week, and I would ask that question to every audience. You know, I would say, how many people here have ever gone on a vacation, eaten more, exercised less, and lost weight? And if I'm speaking to a room full of 75 people, you'll see 20, 30 hands go up. Um, yeah. It's not uncommon at all. You know, according to science, that's impossible. But it's actually what happens, you know. We need to trust our own observation. We need to trust our own instincts, we need to trust our bodies more, you know. If I'm constantly yeah. weighing myself and fighting food and believing that I'm going to gain weight if I eat this or do that or don't do this, we are creating this biochemical milieu of stress chemistry, really, Yeah. which impacts the body. So, so where do you think for you, based on where you're at now, what do you think is next for you in terms of making – your experience of life, your experience of your body, your experience of your weight, even better? Like, what, what do you think that would look like for you? Uh, that would look like for me getting out more in nature, walking the dog more often, uh, being, becoming more active physically is what that would look like for me. Yeah. Cuz I'm pretty I'm pretty good with my diet. I have a I have a I have a pretty good diet and I'm much more relaxed around food. So I would like to move more. Mhm. Mm That's I think that would be great. And also I need to get my uh coaching business off the ground because um I have a son in uh Oregon and I have a partner in Finland and they want to have three children, my son and his wife and so I want to be traveling a lot. So the next thing that needs to happen for me is to get my finances in order and also I'd like to do more movement. Mm. Yeah. Something that makes me happy. Yeah. Good for you. And, and honestly, I, I personally love how you answered that question. You know, you, you said, you know, part of the answer is, okay, I want to move more and, and yeah, we could equate moving more with healthier body and weight loss you know, but you also want to have a certain professional expression and a certain career expression. Reality is the more we become personally empowered, I believe the more we become metabolically empowered, you know, the more you and I become the best people that we can be. Yeah. The more the body, I think, has the best chance to be what it can potentially be at any given age, at any given moment in time. So... I think, I think our task is, you know, when it comes to weight loss, is to defocus on the weight loss per se, focus on gaining life. 
as opposed yeah. to loony, losing weight. And yeah, there might be tweaks we make with the diet, with the exercise and with what you eat and what you don't eat and all that sort of thing. But really, we have to get out of this deprivation mode and into life. And it feels like not it feels like it sounds a lot like that's what you're doing and and yeah and you've seen some success with that so I'm I'm super happy for you congratulations again <laughs> thank you very much I'm super happy too and if it wasn't for that aha moment that I got from you when you said you've got the winning lottery ticket in your pocket mm-hmm. like that really and that, and from this one I think is what you just said just now is that if we become the best version of ourselves who we can be the body follows suit. So that would be my takeaway from this call. Yes. That's a great way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. Yeah. Bingo. And, and I, I want to say one more thing about this too. And that is, it's not always the case that one aha moment can shift our body or shift our life. But it is often the case. It is mm-hmm. often the case that when we have a shift in how we perceive things, yeah. Everything can shift. And, and and personally, that's what I look for. So when we had our first session, when I'm in any session with anybody, I am in the back of my mind. I'm always asking the question. And I might not find it in a session. I might not find it in 10 sessions, but I might find it in the 20th. You know, I'm always looking for what's going to help create a perceptual shift such that there's a ripple effect into the rest of our life. Um, so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that not just for you, but for people listening in, just, just think of the times in your life, for goodness sakes, when one shift in your perception just changed everything. And sometimes those shifts not, it can change our outer life, but it also can change our metabolic life. So it's exciting stuff. It is. <laughs> it is exciting. Yeah. yeah. It's great. So, Iris, I appreciate you being such a good sport. I appreciate having this connection with you. We are kind of all the way across the world from each other. You're on the east coast of (laughs) Australia. I'm here in Boulder, Colorado, and we get to have this beautiful, intimate moment together. What a great thing, huh? Yeah, wonderful. It's really great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And yeah. I yeah, and I appreciate your generosity of spirit and sharing with everybody, you know, what what your journey and your breakthrough. So, thank you everybody for tuning in once again. I'm Mark David on behalf of the Psychology of Eating podcast. There's always more to come, my friends. You take care. See you, Iris. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for listening to the Psychology of Eating podcast. To learn more about the breakthrough body of work we teach here at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, please sign up for our free video series at ipe.tips. That's I for Institute, P for Psychology, E for Eating, tips, T-I-P-S. You'll learn about the cutting-edge principles of dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition that have helped millions of people forever transform their relationship with food, body, and health.